for me, it is immensely rewarding to read early Quaker writings, particularly ones that are invitational to, a, to, the, to the profundities of the, of the inward life. And over the years, as, I, as I've become further acquainted with them, I've become persuaded that it's useful to hear the, the echoes of, of the biblical imagery that are just uh, scattered throughout them. Because when we, when we understand, we exp- when we explore those passages and, and, and understand those, those allusions, it opens up new worlds of possibility for us. My name is Michael Burkle. I live in Richmond, Indiana, where I am a member of Clear Creek uh, Friends Meeting, part of Ohio Valley Yearly Meeting. And I work at the Earlham School of Religion, where I teach courses in spirituality and in interfaith studies. And so I'd like to walk us through uh, just a few phrases, uh, a short passage from a letter written by George Fox in 1663 to Quakers who were in prison. They were being persecuted for their faith. They were suffering for their fidelity to their community. And he wrote to offer them consolation and hope and joy. Sing and rejoice, you children of the day and of the light. For the Lord is at work in this thick night of darkness that may be felt. Truth does flourish as the rose. Lilies do grow among the thorns the plants atop the hills, and upon them the lambs do skip and play. It's beautiful imagery. It's a wonderfully consoling letter to those who are in prison. However, if you listen to this with an ear for the biblical imagery that's in it, you hear hear a much deeper message. Sing and rejoice, it begins. You can debate whether or not they rejoiced much, but I think you can generally agree they were not, re- early Quakers were not renowned for their choral work. And so maybe he's quoting the Bible. In fact, he is. He's quoting Zechariah, one of those little skinny minor prophets near the end of the Hebrew scriptures. Um, chapter 2, verse 10, which begins, Sing and Rejoice, and it is written to people who are in exile, assuring them that God is with them and that they will come home. So it's a message of consolation and a proclamation, a promise of, of, of liberty to those who are captive. So sing and rejoice, ye children of the day and of the light. Children of the day and of the light is one of the ways that Paul describes the believers in the epistle, uh, first epistle to the Thessalonians in chapter 5. <laughs> And, well, I probably don't need to say much to Quakers about the light, but just to let you know that it's <clears throat> what one of my Quaker historian friends would, would say is one of the biblical doo-wops, uh, one, of the, one of the verses peeking through the background of the, of the text of this letter. For the Lord is at work in this thick night of darkness that may be felt. That actually is from the book of Exodus, and it is one of the plagues, you know, frogs, flies, and so forth. One of the plagues was a plague of darkness. The darkness, it says, was so thick that it could be felt. Now, however, the children of the Hebrews, who were faithful to their God, experienced light in that time of darkness. Here is George Fox writing to these prisoners, and prisons were very dark back then. And he's promising them that the light is with them. He goes on to say that truth shall flourish like the rose. Flourish like the rose is a passage from Isaiah chapter 35, another scriptural passage that speaks to exiles, saying that you are suffering now, but you will have liberation. You will have freedom, despite your present captivity. The lilies do grow among the thorns. Now that is a a, a phrase from the Song of Songs, which is a a short book in the Bible that's filled with love poetry. And in the history of the Christian church and of the Jewish synagogue, the Song of Songs was understood to be a love song between God and the community, or, or a mystical love song between God and the soul. 
And so to say, you know, in, in the Song of Songs, the speaker says, my, 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 my beloved is like, like, a, a, like a rose among, a lily among the thorns. Uh, it, is, it, it is to say that, well, I think for me, it hints at a profound intimacy of divine presence that they can find, that can be felt, even though they are in a very bleak situation, imprisoned for their faith. And the letter continues, the plants shall grow atop the hills. This, I believe, is a reference to a passage in the book of Jeremiah, uh, the famous prophet during, written during a time of war, saying to those who are in exile again, that you shall come home and that you shall plant your, 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 your crops uh, on, on, on the hills and you shall reap them, you shall harvest them, which uh, is not what happens when, a, when a, an invading army comes through and, and, uh, and eats all your produce. So again, it's a message of homecoming and of renewal and of comfort. And he says, upon them, the, the, the lambs shall skip and play. Well, uh, the book of uh, the Song of Songs describes the beloved again as skipping, you know, like a gazelle on the hillside. It could also be a reference to, to Psalm uh, 114, which in fact um, is a retelling of the story of Exodus. Once again, a story of release from captivity. And so, what's happening in this letter? Well, if you take out the, the biblical allusions, you're basically left with a few conjunctions and some random punctuation. And believe me, punctuation was really random in the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> and so, by, by catching all these allusions, by hearing these biblical echoes, you encounter a kind of layeredness of meaning. Not that he was writing in a secret code, but rather he was using what early friends experienced as the language of the soul. Because for them, the, the, the biblical story was not just something that happened long ago. It was something that happens within each reader. It is relived. You know, each of us has our own exile. Each of us has our own exodus as well. Each of us has a return to the land uh, uh, flowing with abundance. And so <clears throat> what's the value of, of, of hearing those biblical echoes is that I think we can appreciate the depth of the experience that early friends had, and we can feel, feel even more fully invited into them. I'm here at Clear Creek Friends Meeting on the campus of Earlham College. This is one of the three statues of Mary Dyer right behind me. I just wanted to say thank you for watching this Quaker Speak video. We release new videos every Thursday, and you can click on this button over here to subscribe to the project. You can support us for as little as $1 per video. That button is just below me, and you can see all the videos we've ever released in this playlist down here. Have a great Thursday.